Welcome to Snoozecast, a podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on Instagram at snoozecast to find behind the scenes content. If you would like to get an email once a week with upcoming sleep stories and other news, subscribe to the Snoozeletter at snoozecast.com. This episode is brought to you by Quiet Motion and Small Whisperings. Tonight, we'll read another excerpt from The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham, published in 1908. This series does not require you to follow a plot between episodes. However, if you would like to start from the beginning and listen easily in order, go to snoozecast.com slash series. In this episode, Rat encounters a wayfarer, the sea rat, and invites him to lunch. The sea rat regales him with tales of maritime adventures and invites Rat to join him. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. The water rat was restless, and he did not know exactly why. To all appearance, the summer's pomp was still at fullest height, and although in the tilled acres, green had given way to gold, though rowans were reddening, and the woods were dashed here and there with a tawny fierceness, yet light and warmth and color were still present in undiminished measure clean of any chilly premonitions of the passing year. But the constant chorus of the orchards and hedges had shrunk to a casual evensong from a few yet unwearied performers. The robin was beginning to assert himself once more, and there was a feeling in the air of change and departure. The cuckoo, of course, had long been silent, but many another feathered friend, for months a part of the familiar landscape and its small society, was missing too, and it seemed that the ranks thinned steadily day by day. Rat, ever observant of all winged movement, saw that it was taking daily a southing tendency, and even as he lay in bed at night, he thought he could make out, passing in the darkness overhead, the beat and quiver of impatient pinions, obedient to the peremptory call. Nature's grand hotel has its season, like the others. As the guests one by one pack, pay, and depart, and the seats at the table shrink pitifully at each succeeding meal. As suites of rooms are closed, carpets taken up, and waiters sent away, those boarders who are staying on until the next year's full reopening, cannot help being somewhat affected by all these flittings and farewells, this eager discussion of plans, routes, and fresh quarters, this daily shrinkage in the stream of comradeship. Why this craving for change? Why not stay on quietly here, like us, and be jolly? 
You don't know this hotel out of the season, and what fun we have amongst ourselves, we fellows who remain and see the whole interesting year out. All very true. No doubt the others always reply, We quite envy you, and some other year perhaps. But just now, we have engagements, and there's the bus at the door. Our time is up. So, they depart with a smile and a nod, and we miss them and feel resentful. The rat was a self-sufficing sort of animal, rooted to the land, and whoever went, he stayed. Still, he could not help noticing what was in the air and feeling some of its influence in his bones. Leaving the waterside, where rushes stood thick and tall in the stream that was beginning to become sluggish and slow, he wandered countrywards, crossed a field or two of pasturage already looking dusty and parched, and thrust into the great sea of wheat, ye yellow, wavy, and murmurous, full of quiet motion and small whisperings. Here he often loved to wander through the forest of stiff, strong stalks that carried their own golden sky away over his head, a sky that was always dancing, shimmering, softly talking, or swaying strongly to the passing wind and recovering itself with a toss and a merry laugh. Here, too, he had many small friends, a society complete in itself, leading full and busy lives, but always with a spare moment to gossip and exchange news with a visitor. Today, however, though they were civil enough, the field mice and harvest mice seemed preoccupied. Many were digging and tunneling busily. Others, gathered together in small groups, examined plans and drawings of small flats, stated to be desirable and compact, and situated conveniently near the stores some were hauling out dusty trunks and dress baskets. Others were already elbow-deep packing their belongings, while everywhere piles and bundles of wheat, oats, barley, beech mast and nuts lay about, ready for transport. Here's old Ratty! they cried as soon as they saw him. Come and bear a hand, rat, and don't stand about idle. What sort of games are you up to? said the water rat severely. You know it isn't time to be thinking of winter quarters yet, by a long way. Oh yes, we know that, explained a field mouse rather shamefacedly. But it's always as well to be in good time, isn't it? We really must get all the furniture and baggage and stores moved out of this before those horrid machines begin clicking round the fields. And then, you know, the best flats get picked up so quickly nowadays. And if you're late, you have to put up with anything. And they want such a lot of doing up, too, before they're fit to move into. Of course, we're early. We know that, but we're only just making a fresh start. Oh, bother starts, said the rat. It's a splendid day. Come for a row, or a stroll along the hedges, or a picnic in the woods, or something. Well, I think not today, thank you, replied the field mouse hurriedly. 
Perhaps some other day, when we've more time. The rat, with a snort of contempt, swung round to go, tripped over a hat box, and fell with undignified remarks. If people would be more careful, said a field mouse rather stiffly, and look where they're going, people wouldn't hurt themselves and forget themselves. Mind that hold all rat. You'd better sit down somewhere. In an hour or two, we may be more free to attend to you. You won't be free, as you call it, much this side of Christmas. I can see that, retorted the rat grumpily, as he picked his way out of the field. He returned somewhat despondently to his river again, his faithful, steady-going old river, which never packed up, flitted, or went into winter quarters. In the osiers which fringed the bank, he spied a swallow sitting. Presently, it was joined by another, and then by a third, and the birds, fidgeting restlessly on their bough, talked together earnestly and low. What's the hurry? I call it simply ridiculous. Oh, we're not off yet, if that's what you mean, replied the first swallow. We're only making plans and arranging things, talking it over, you know, what route we're taking this year and where we'll stop and so on. That's half the fun. Fun, said the rat. Now that's just what I don't understand. If you've got to leave this pleasant place, and your friends who will miss you, and your snug homes that you've just settled into, why, when the hour strikes, I've no doubt you'll go bravely, and face all the trouble and discomfort and change and newness, and make believe that you're not very unhappy but to want to talk about it, or even think about it, till you really need to. No, you don't understand, naturally, said the second swallow. First, we feel it stirring within us, a sweet unrest. Then back come the recollections one by one, like homing pigeons. They flutter through our dreams at night, they fly with us in our wheelings and circlings by day. We hunger to inquire of each other, to compare notes and assure ourselves that it was all really true, as one by one the scents and sounds and names of long-forgotten places come gradually back and beckon to us. Couldn't you stop on for just this year? suggested the water rat, wistfully. We'll all do our best to make you feel at home. You've no idea what good times we have here, while well, you're far away. I tried stopping on one year, said the third swallow. I had grown so fond of the place that when the time came, I hung back and let the others go on without me. Never shall I forget the blissful feeling of the hot sun again on my back as I sped down to the lakes that lay so blue and placid below me, and the taste of my first fat insect. The past was like a bad dream. The future was all happy holiday as I moved southwards week by week, easily, lazily, lingering as long as I dared, but always heeding the call. No, I had had my warning. Never again did I think of disobedience. Ah, yes, the call of the South, of the South, twittered the other two dreamily. 
its songs, its hues, its radiant air. Oh, do you remember? And, forgetting the rat, they slid into passionate reminiscence while he listened fascinated, and his heart burned within him. In himself, too, he knew that it was vibrating at last, that chord hitherto dormant and unsuspected. The mere chatter of these southern-bound birds, their pale and second-hand reports, had yet power to awaken this wild, new sensation and thrill him through and through with it. What would one moment of the real thing work in him? One passionate touch of the real southern sun, one waft of the authentic odor. With closed eyes, he dared to dream a moment in full abandonment, and when he looked again, the river seemed steely and chill, the green fields gray and lightless. Then, his loyal heart seemed to cry out on his weaker self for its treachery. Why do you ever come back, then, at all? he demanded of the swallows, jealously. What do you find to attract you in this poor, drab little country? Do you think, said the first swallow, that the other call is not for us, too, in its due season? The call of lush meadow grass, wet orchards, warm, insect-haunted ponds, of browsing cattle, of haymaking, and all the farm buildings clustering round the house of the perfect eaves. Do you suppose, asked the second one, that you are the only living thing? I think I stumbled there. In due time, said the other, we shall be homesick once more for quiet water lilies swaying on the surface of an English stream. But today, all that seems pale and thin and very far away. Just now our blood dances to other music. They fell a-twittering among themselves once more, and this time their babble was of violet seas, tawny sands, and lizard-haunted walls. Restlessly, the rat wandered off once more, climbed the slope that rose gently from the north bank of the river, and lay looking out towards the great ring of downs that barred his vision further southwards. His simple horizon here there too, his mountains of the moon, his limit behind which lay nothing he had cared to see or to know. Today, to him gazing south with a newborn need stirring in his heart, the clear sky over their long, low outline seemed to pulsate with promise. Today, the unseen was everything, the unknown the only real fact of life. On this side of the hills, was now the real blank. On the other lay the crowded and colored panorama that his inner eye was seeing so clearly. What seas lay beyond, green, leaping and crested? What sun-bathed coasts, along which the white villas glittered against the olive woods, what quiet harbors, thronged with gallant shipping, bound for purple islands of wine and spice, islands set low in languorous waters. He rose and descended riverwards once more, 
then changed his mind and sought the side of the dusty lane. There, lying half buried in the thick, cool, underhedge tangle that bordered it, he could muse on the road and all the wondrous world that it led to, on all the wayfarers, too, that might have trodden it, and the fortunes and adventures they had gone to seek or found unseeking, out there beyond, beyond. Footsteps fell on his ear, and the figure of one that walked somewhat wearily came into view, and he saw that it was a rat, and a very dusty one. The wayfarer, as he reached him, saluted with a gesture of courtesy that had something foreign about it, hesitated a moment, then, with a simple smile, turned from the track and sat down by his side in the cool herbage. He seemed tired, and the rat let him rest unquestioned, understanding something of what was in his thoughts, knowing, too, the value all animals attach at times to mere silent companionship, when the weary muscles slacken and the mind marks time. The wayfarer was lean and keen-featured and somewhat bowed at the shoulders. His paws were thin and long, his eyes much wrinkled at the corners and he wore small gold earrings in his neatly set, well-shaped ears. His knitted jersey was of a faded blue. His breeches, patched and stained, were based on a blue foundation, and his small belongings that he carried were tied up in a blue cotton handkerchief. When he had rested a while, the stranger sighed, snuffed the air, and looked about him. That was clover, that warm whiff on the breeze, he remarked, and those are cows we hear cropping the grass behind us and blowing softly between mouthfuls. There is a sound of distant reapers and yonder rises a blue line of cottage smoke against the woodland. The river runs somewhere close by, for I hear the call of a moorhen, and I see by your build that you're a freshwater mariner. Everything seems asleep, and yet going on all the time. It is a goodly life that you lead, friend, no doubt the best in the world. If only you are strong enough to lead it. Yes, it's the life, the only life to live, responded the water rat dreamily, and without his usual wholehearted conviction. I did not say that exactly, replied the stranger cautiously, but no doubt it's the best. I've tried it, and I know. And because I've just tried it, six months of it, and know it's the best, here I am, foot sore and hungry, tramping away from it, tramping southward, following the old call, back to the old life, the life which is mine and which will not let me go. Is this, then, yet another of them? mused the rat. And where have you come from now? he asked. He hardly dared to ask where he was bound for. He seemed to know the answer only too well. Nice little farm, replied the wayfarer briefly. Up along in that direction. He nodded northwards. Never mind about it. I had everything I could want, everything I had any right to expect of life and more, and here I am, 
Glad to be here all the same, though. So many miles further on the road. So many hours nearer to my heart's desire. His shining eyes held fast to the horizon, and he seemed to be listening for some sound that was wanting from that inland acreage. Vocal as it was with the cheerful music of pasturage and farmyard. You're not one of us, said the water rat, nor yet a farmer, nor even, I should judge, of this country. Right, replied the stranger. I'm a seafaring rat, I am, and the port I originally hail from is Constantinople, though I'm a sort of foreigner there, too, in a manner of speaking. You will have heard of Constantinople, friend, a fair city, and an ancient and glorious one. And you may have heard, too, of Sigurd, king of Norway, and how he sailed thither with sixty ships and how he and his men rode up through streets all canopied in their honor with purple and gold, and how the emperor and empress came down and banqueted with him on board his ship. I know them all, and they all know me. Set me down anywhere, and I am home again. I suppose you go on great voyages, said the water rat, with growing interest. Months and months out of sight of land, and provisions running short, and allowance as to water, and your mind communing with the mighty ocean, and all that sort of thing? By no means, said the sea rat, frankly. Such a life as you describe would not suit me at all. It's the jolly times on shore that appeal to me, as much as any seafaring. Well, perhaps you have chosen the better way, said the water rat, but rather doubtfully. Tell me something of your coasting, then, and what sort of harvest an animal of spirit might hope to bring home from it to warm his latter days with gallant memories by the fireside. For my life, I confess to you, feels to me today somewhat narrow and circumscribed. My last voyage, began the sea rat, that landed me eventually in this country, bound with high hopes for my inland farm, will serve as a good example of any of them, and indeed as an epitome of my highly colored life. I shipped myself on board a small trading vessel bound for Constantinople by classic seas to the Grecian islands. Those were the golden days and balmy nights. Ah, the shores swimming in an atmosphere of amber, rose, and aquamarine we lay in wide landlocked harbors. We roamed through ancient and noble cities until at last, one morning, as the sun rose royally behind us, we rode into Venice down a path of gold. Oh, Venice is a fine city wherein a rat can wander at his ease and take his pleasure. Or... When weary of wandering, can sit at the edge of the Grand Canal at night, feasting with his friends, when the air is full of music and the sky full of stars, and the lights flash and shimmer on the polished steel prows of the swaying gondolas, packed so that you could walk across the canal on them from side to side. He was silent for a while, and the water rat, silent too and enthralled, floated on dream canals and heard a phantom song pealing high 
between vaporous gray wave-lapped walls. Southwards we sailed again at last, continued the sea rat, coasting down the Italian shore, till finally we made Palermo, and there I quitted for a long, happy spell on shore. Besides, Sicily is one of my happy hunting grounds. I know everybody there, and their ways just suit me. I spent many jolly weeks in the island, staying with friends up country. When I grew restless again, I took advantage of a ship that was trading to Sardinia and Corsica, and very glad I was to feel the fresh breeze and the sea spray in my face once more. But isn't it very hot and stuffy down in the hold, I think you call it? asked the water rat. The seafarer looked at him with the suspicion of a wink. I'm an old hand, he remarked with much simplicity. The captain's cabin's good enough for me. The sea rat continued the history of his latest voyage. Spellbound and quivering with excitement, the water rat followed the adventurer league by league, over stormy bays, through crowded roadsteads, across harbor bars on a racing tide, up winding rivers that hid their busy little towns round a sudden turn, and left him with a regretful sigh planted at his dull inland farm, about which he desired to hear nothing. By this time, the seafarer felt refreshed, and his voice more vibrant, his eyes lit with a brightness that seemed caught from some faraway sea beacon. His eyes were of the changing, foam-streaked gray-green of leaping northern seas. And the talk, the wonderful talk, flowed on. Or was it speech entirely? Or did it pass at times into song? Shanty of the sailors weighing the dripping anchor, sonorous hum of the shrouds in a tearing nor'easter, ballad of the fisherman hauling his nets at sundown against an apricot sky, chords of guitar and mandolin from gondola. Did it change into the cry of the wind, plaintive at first, angrily shrill as it freshened, rising to a tearing whistle, sinking to a musical trickle of air from the leech of the bellying sail? All these sounds the spell-bound listener seemed to hear and with them the hungry complaint of the gulls and the sea mews, the soft thunder of the breaking wave, the cry of the protesting shingle. Back into speech again it passed, and with beating heart he was following the adventures of a dozen seaports, the fights, the escapes, the rallies, the comradeships, the gallant undertakings, or he searched islands for treasure, fished in still lagoons, and dozed day long on warm white sand. 
of deep sea fishings he heard tell, and mighty silver gatherings of the mile long net, of sudden perils, noise of breakers on a moonless night, of the merry homecoming, the headland rounded, the harbor lights opened out, the groups seen dimly on the quay, the cheery hail, the splash of the hawser, the trudge up the steep little street towards the comforting glow of red curtained windows. Lastly, in his waking dream, it seemed to him that the adventurer had risen to his feet, but was still speaking, still holding him fast with his sea-gray eyes. And now, he was saying softly, I take to the road again, holding on southwestward for many a long and dusty day, till at last I've reached the little gray sea town I know so well that clings along one steep side of the harbor. There, through dark doorways, you look down flights of stone steps, overhung by great pink tufts of valerian and ending in a patch of sparkling blue water. The little boats that lie tethered to the rings of the old sea wall are gaily painted as those I clambered in and out in my own childhood. The salmon leap on the flood tide. Schools of mackerel flash and play past quay sides and foreshores. And by the windows, the great vessels glide by night and day up to their moorings or forth to the open sea. And you, you will come too, young brother, for the days pass and never return, and the south still waits for you. Take the adventure, heed the call. Now, ere the irrevocable moment passes, then some day, some day long hence, jog home here if you will. When the cup has been drained, and the play has been played, and sit down by your quiet river with a store of goodly memories for company, you can easily overtake me on the road, for you are young, and I am aging, and go softly. I will linger and look back, and at last... I will surely see you coming, eager and light-hearted, with all the south in your face. The voice died away and ceased as an insect's tiny trumpet dwindles swiftly into silence. And the water rat, paralyzed, and staring, saw at last but a distant speck on the white surface of the road. Mechanically he rose and proceeded to repack the luncheon basket carefully and without haste. Mechanically, he returned home, gathered together a few small necessities and special treasures he was fond of, and put them in a satchel. 
acting with slow deliberation, moving about the room like a sleepwalker, listening ever with parted lips. He swung the satchel over his shoulder, carefully selected a stout stick for his wayfaring, and with no haste, but with no hesitation at all, he stepped across the threshold, just as the mole appeared at the door. Why, where are you off to, Ratty? asked the mole in great surprise, grasping him by the arm. Going south with the rest of them, murmured the rat in a dreamy monotone, never looking at him. See words first, and then on shipboard. And so to the shores that are calling.